My name is Judith Boyle. I'm the event supervi supervisor for Wacom. Uh, this is my second year as event supervisor. Uh, last year I served as an interim, and this year I'm officially the uh, event supervisor here. Um, I have coached this event. Uh, I asked originally, I started coaching it about 20 years ago when my son was doing it. And then after taking several years off, I have coached it on and off at the elementary and secondary level for the last eight years. Uh, I'm still coaching at the secondary level right now. Uh, I have a degree in geology and uh, a love for rocks and barrels. So uh, before we get started, I thought I would go ahead and let everybody know because it seems to be a question I'm getting a lot is uh, where they can find uh, some rock samples. Um, we have arranged and this this information will be posted at the end on one of the slides, but I just wanted to get it out of the way before we started. Um, We've arranged for a collector and a seller to come to the workshop, which is being held on the 28th of January at the MISD. Again, this information will be on the last slide. Uh, he is going to bring quite a few of the samples that are on the rules list. He doesn't have them all, but he has, he says, most of them. He will be selling them. He, uh, he does this at a lot of the invitationals at the secondary level. I have not personally dealt with him, but I know a lot of people who have, and they have been very positive about the stuff he sells. Now, the only hiccup is he will only take cash or a check. His samples are very reasonably priced, but if you want to purchase, you're going to have to bring cash or a check. So with that out of the way, I'm going to go ahead and share uh, the PowerPoint document with you. And I'm going to put my glasses on. change my view. Sorry about all this. I thought I was burning. Okay, here we go. This is Rock Out 2023. Okay, now the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to go over the rules. Uh, each rule, I'm going to bring out some points that I think are important, and uh, if you have a question, please feel free when I finish that slide to raise your hand, and we'll acknowledge you, and you can go ahead and ask your question. Uh, then there's a vet description. I'm going to give you some information on how to make your chart, building your team, some coaching tips, some have, again, tips on making tests, and then some resources, and we'll talk about some available PowerPoints that I have. Okay, so the rules overview. Now, the rules are posted on the website. I'm sure you all have probably been there, but here's the address, web address if you need it. The number one rule I have, the hint I have is make sure you read the rules. Um, there's a lot of questions that you might have that if you go back and read the rules again, you'll find that that question has been answered in the rules. If you find something or have a question that has not been answered in the rules, oh, okay. 
I don't know what has happened here. Vinish, I lost my PowerPoint. Okay, give me a second. I can put it up. Or you can reshare. You can stop yeah, the share and then reshare. Again. I don't know what I'm getting now. Okay. Give me one second. I have it out. Okay, here we go. There we go. Yeah. Um, there is, if you go to the website and you have a question that is not answered, uh, you go to the FAQs, which I should have put in here, and you could post that question and someone will get back to you with an answer within a couple of days. The event itself runs 30 minutes. Uh, students may bring a chart with them. We'll talk a little bit about making the chart and the things that could go on your chart a little bit later on. Uh, this year's focus is sedimentary rocks and rock forming minerals. I will hit this point again, but do not exclude other rocks and minerals. Uh, that this is going to be pretty equally, equally spread out between all rocks and minerals. And teams will be required to identify only those rocks and minerals listed in the rules. There is not an exception to this, but I want you to make sure that they realize I may show them a rock or a mineral that is not on the list, but I will not ask them to identify it. I will only ask them about a property that they should be aware of. The chances of this happening are not slim, but this would not be a major part of the test. This would only be one question or maybe two, but they should be ready to be able to identify a feature such as a cleavage that is on a mineral that they may not know. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, we'll move on. Okay, rule number one. Uh, the test is approximately 20 stations. It will not go over 20, but it it's most likely going to be 20. And it should be 20 at the practice events also. So they will be used to, if they go to a practice event, they will be used to having the one minute per station to answer all the questions at each station. The answers will be recorded on zip grade sheets. Uh, it's very important that you get your kids used to filling out these zip grades. Every year we have several teams that come in, especially the younger kids who have not worked with a zip grade before and they have to be instructed on how to fill them out. So it's important that they have at least practice with these. At most stations, the teams will find a box with samples in it. I've got a picture in here that will show you what I'm talking about. They will find a box. There will be a lid on the box. Well, there will be a lid on the box, and on top of that lid, there will be a letter to tell them so that they know that they're at the right station. They will be told to open the box. When they open the box, there will be questions inside the lid of the box and samples inside the box it's, it, itself. Uh, they can touch the samples unless they're specifically told not to. They can pick them up, they can turn them over, they can do what they need to do, but please stress to them to return the samples to the box once they are done at that station. Now, this is another thing that threw a lot of kids last year. Some stations will not have samples inside. There will just be a set of questions inside the lid. There may be a diagram 
Uh, there may only be questions, but let them be aware that if they open the box and don't find samples, there are still going to be questions that they need to answer. Last year, this was a problem that we ran to with uh, several teams again. They opened the box, they didn't see any samples, so they were unaware that they had to answer questions. And they just stood there until we noticed that they didn't, they were not doing anything and caught it. Also, let them know that if they have a question, when they open the box and they see something that looks weird or they don't understand, to raise their hands immediately, we have people in the tests to come help them and answer these kind of questions. Not to just stand there and be confused because there will be someone to help them. We want them to succeed. We're not trying to confuse them or trick them in any way. Again, I mentioned this a little earlier. You will not, they will not start that station until I tell them to open the box and find the questions attached to the inside of the lid. Uh, they will be told to close the box when their time is up, move on to the next station. When they move on to the next station, do not open the box until we tell them to. Their time does not count until we tell them to open the box. There will be four to six multiple choice questions at each station. Uh, the questions will be worth one and four points each. There may be multiple answers to a question, but they will be told this in the question. It will say either select two or they're just to answer with one answer. That's how that sometimes you'll get a question which is worth between one and three. One, one answer may be worth 1.2 points and the other answer may be worth 1.7 points. The questions again will be multiple choice or true or false, no short answers. Uh, each question will have a value between one and four or five. Okay, well, that was a typo. Um, we'll go between one and four. Uh, tiebreakers will be predetermined, but they will not be noted. So just answer every question as if it was worth any, you know, uh, as they were all worth the same. Answer every question and just move through the test. Don't worry about whether it's a tiebreaker or it's more important. Any questions on this slide? Okay. This is a picture of a sample station where you see the letter is attached to the lid of the box. And when they open the box, there's some questions there for them. Rule two. So the rocks and minerals needed to identify are listed in the rules and only those rocks and minerals. Uh, you only have to identify the rocks and minerals listed. We already talked about that. Okay, this is really important. Even though it says the focus is sedimentary rocks and rock forming minerals, as I said before, do not put all your emphasis on these. This mainly is because every year to vary things a little bit, we will add one year igneous and then take those extra igneous rocks and minerals out. And then next year we will go to sedimentary and then the, take those rocks and minerals out and the next year we'll bed and bed and morph it. So the test will cover all of them equally. Uh, to cover the sedimentary focus, the three new rocks and three new minerals that have been added, uh, the breccia, coquina, and travertine. The three minerals are aragonite, barite, and dolomite. The reason that we've picked these rocks and minerals as is uh, that these are very common, very important rocks for them to learn in the sedimentary family, and the minerals 
are very common and very important minerals that go into the formation of these rocks. Now, permanently, we're going to add some rocks and minerals. Well, actually, these are all minerals. There's going to be some minerals added back in that had previously been covered in the scope of the test, but had been removed because we were not being able, we were not able to get them with a previous rock supplier. We have added them back in because these are important minerals. If your students continue on to the secondary level, every rock and mineral that I am asking them to know about will be included in the secondary uh, plus about double. So it's important that they learn these, especially if they want to move on. Do we have any questions at this time? Okay. Rule three, uh, rock characteristic uh, questions. So again, this could be color, texture, uses, physical characteristic, special properties, one of which is very important that they know is the reaction to three molar hydrochloric acid. This is a very important test and a very basic test, especially when you're talking about sedimentary rocks and minerals because one of the basis for these rocks and minerals is calcium carbonate, which is CaCO3, and it reacts very strongly with hydrochloric acid, and it's one of the basic tests to check and see if you have a, sub, sub, a lot of these sedimentary rocks and minerals. It's very basic, it's very important that they know this. The kids will not be handling the hydrochloric acid, but they need to know if the rock or mineral reacts. Environments of formations describe the location and types of environments that would produce a specific specimen. So for example, with igneous rocks, one of the big ones is whether they form above or below ground. This affects the texture of the rock, and it's one of the major ways to identify igneous rocks. For sedimentary, are they formed in a river environment or a desert environment? Uh, some of these rocks can be formed in both. Some are found by rivers. Some are found by caves. Some are formed in certain hot spring environments. So these are the things that we're looking at them knowing. Also, and I'm gonna get into this more in my workshop, but uh, you could see certain structures in sub-sedimentary rocks that show you ripple marks or mud cracks, and that can tell you, specifically mud cracks, can tell you that it is formed in an environment that once was wet and has over time dried out. For metamorphic, one of the big ones is large-scale and small-scale metamorphism. Again, this is something I'll get into more detail with at the workshop, but uh, there's the three basic types of metamorphism we'll be talking about are regional, dynamic, and contact. Uh, contact metamorphism is something that usually uh, happens in a very small area. Regional is a much larger scale and contributes to mountain building. And this, again, will give you hints as to not just what the rock they have is, but how it was formed. So it answers the question of not just what it is, but why it is. So minerals. Uh, big ones with minerals are evaporates or alteration of other minerals. There are certain minerals that we'll talk about that as they weather, they weather into a different mineral. Uh, or as uh, you have one mineral and an additional element has added to that mineral and it becomes a 
different mineral. So they start with the same base, but over time, or not over time, but with the addition of this different element, you have variations of the same basic chemical structure. Again, don't panic. I'm not going to ask them to identify these chemical structures, but I want them to be aware of these principles. Again, this is something that will be, uh, I, I will go into more detail in the workshop. And also there will be slides posted from previous years. And I hope to have some new slides posted within the next week or so. So you can all look through those and there will be more information in these slides. This is just to give you a basic idea of where to go and what to do, a framework. Don't panic. This is this can be done. Any questions? OK. Rule four. Uh, one of the things that I think is very important for kids to understand is the rock cycle. It basically. It's kind of the backbone of how rocks are formed, what goes on to change one rock into another rock. Uh, the process of the formation of igneous rocks and the three basic categories are intrusive, intrusive, extrusive and volcanic glass. The things that go into sedimentary rocks, which are, this is a little short list, but like the erosion, deposition and lithification, which is, but the lithification is just a fancy word for turning it into a rock and metamorphic rocks, which is uh, needing to know the effects of heat and pressure on existing rocks. And we're going to go to the next slide. And I've got a kind of nice, I, I like little rock cycle picture here. And this is a very simple one. But if you start with the volcanic eruption, which usually uh, your rock cycles will start with igneous rocks and will start with volcanic eruptions or magma. And if you go counterclockwise from the volcanic eruption, between that eruption and where you see igneous rocks, we have the cooling of the magma or the lava that turns it into an igneous rock. Between igneous rocks and the sedimentary rocks, weathering and erosion and deposition and lithification occur to give you a sedimentary rock. Between the sedimentary rock and the metamorphic rock, pressure and heat are applied to existing rocks that turn them into metamorphic rocks. And then with metamorphic back to volcanic, we have melting and uh, yeah, and so we could end up with magmas under volcanoes or you end up with lavas that volcanoes erupted and that's liquid rock at the surface. So any questions on this? OK. Rule five. Again, we're back with the sedimentary focus topics. Students should be familiar with sedimentary structures such as ripple marks, plain beds, cross beds, graded beds, mud cracks, dunes. Uh, this, I think, covers all of them. It might not check in the rules. But I won't ask them anything that is not in the rules. Uh, again, as I said earlier, I will go more in depth in the slides that will be posted on the website and at the workshop. Uh, again, these are important things for them to know because it gives you a clue as to the environments these rocks have been formed in. It's important, I think, that kids know not just what rock do I have in my hand, but why does it look this way? Because if they understand the why it looks the way it looks, I find it very helpful into, well, this, if I know why, then I know what. 
Sometimes if they just know what it is, if I ask a deeper question instead of just identification, they're a little lost. So make sure that they know as best as you could find. Again, you don't have to go into a lot of depth on this stuff. All right, I mean, they are elementary school children as we know, but trust me, this makes it a lot more interesting for them if they're not just being sat there and taught to just wrote, spill out stuff they've memorized. Make sure they understand what it is that they're saying, not just parroting things back to you. It makes a big difference on how well they do on the test. Anything on this slide? Okay. Rule six. Now we're going to get a little bit into the minerals. I spent a lot of time about the rocks, but there's three categories, so it took a little longer. Uh, characteristic topics are color, luster, density. Uh, sometimes you'll see it referred to as specific gravity, so we will, for the sake of this test, use that term interchangeably. The relative hardness, which is the most scale, the one we're going to be using. Relative hardness means this is not an absolute scale. This is not a hard and fast number. What was done when the Mohs scale was originally invented is this geologist uh, took 10 rock, 10, I'm sorry, minerals. This only refers to minerals. 10 minerals that he felt every geologist would have access to. And he ranked them according to which was the softest, meaning all the other minerals he had in this list would scratch it, to which one was the hardest, meaning that no other minerals included in this list would scratch it. There are, I think we have all but eight, nine, and ten minerals from the Mo scale represented in the list of minerals that they are required to know. These are the only ones that I would worry about them knowing off the top of their head that exact Mohs scale number. Talc is one. They need to know that. Appetite is five. They need to know that. Quartz is seven. They need to know that. If you have a mineral that is listed with a Mohs hardness of, let's say, 3.5 or 3.2 or 3.3, they don't need to memorize that. Don't make them memorize that number. Put that number on their chart. Just have them know it's relatively soft, that it's softer than quartz. Uh, but don't make them memorize that number. That's something that easily goes on the chart and they can look at quickly. Know if it reacts to hydrochloric acid. This is important. This is something they should know. Uh, again, we talked about why it's an important thing. This is something they need to know off the top of their head. Put it on the chart also because, you know, kids forget. But that's something that's important for them to learn. Crystal shapes, which again, uh, we'll go through in more uh, detail. Some minerals can have several crystal shape. Well, yes, more than one crystal shape. Some are almost always going to have the same crystal shape. And some won't have any particular crystal shape as it is. For the ones where it is used as an identifying feature, have them learn that. For ones where there's a couple uh, different shapes, have them learn the most common. The rest, that's material that can be on the chart. The texture, the cleavage, which again, some rocks and minerals, some, 
excuse me when I say rocks, I don't mean to at this point. Some minerals will exhibit a very distinctive cleavage that is used to identify them. If it is a very distinctive cleavage, they need to learn it. If it's not a big identifier, that's something that they could put on their chart if they have time to learn it before the test. Yes, learn it. But in the beginning, it's important to weigh what is an identifying feature or what is very special about that mineral. Uh, fracture, same thing with fracture as with cleavage. Cleavage and fracture are uh, sometimes confusing. I tell people that cleavage can be simplified. You can look at cleavage as the way a mineral wants to break. Fracture is the way a mineral will be forced to break. That's extreme oversimplification and not 100% Correct, uh, correct's not the right word, but it, it's, it's enough to get that idea in their head. And then once they understand it, go on a little deeper. Uh, special properties. One of the special properties that is very helpful is fluorescence. There are a few minerals on our list that will fluoresce, uh, make sure that's that's what I learned, especially with fluorite, where I mean it is basically the property is named for that mineral. Make sure they was that. But there are other minerals that are not quite so obvious. The fluorescence is important with. There is a property called piezoelectricity, which is uh, important to quartz. So that would be one I would make sure they understood. Uh, some of them have special optical properties, such as double refraction. Those are important. Special properties are always good to learn. It's something that will help them identify them or sets them apart from other similar minerals. Uses, uh, I'm going to let you know right now, uh, some of these minerals have like 15 uses. So what I would do is the major use, the thing that they're most used in, the thing that's most known for it, make sure they know that one. Uh, but when you get into like five, six, seven, or eight different uses, put it on the chart. Okay, don't make them be aware of it. You don't want them to not be aware of it. But don't expect them to learn all of the uses for all of these minerals. And the same thing goes when you're talking about the rocks. Pick out the important things. Uh, the rest of them can go on their chart. And environments of formation. We talked about uh, evaporates. So the gypsum family are evaporate minerals. And that's important to know. So that's something they should know. Again, all this can go on the chart. But that's something they should know. Some of them are only formed in specific types of environments. If you find that in your information, make sure they learn that. And uh, again, the topics will be covered in the slides and at the workshop in a little more depth. But I wanted to give you a place to start. Uh, color, I want to jump back to color. Uh, color is not really a good identifier. It can give you a starting place, uh, but so many of these minerals, have, like calcite and fluorite, can be in so many different colors that for them, it's, it's not really a good place to start. But Galena, is going to be silver gray and it will always be silver gray so that's one where it's important that color 
to give you a, a direction to start. Luster just talks about the way it reflects light. Metallic, uh, submetallic, there's a lot of categories, which again will be more in the slides and in the workshop. So any questions before we move on? Rule seven. Okay. Uh, oh, we need to start winding this up. The chart. Okay, so they can bring the chart to be used during the event. One chart per team. The team is eight and a half by fourteen. We've talked quite a bit about what can go on and not anything can go on the chart. But sure, real quick, like, uh, uh, Ball has a question. Okay. Yes. Uh, where I'm not. Can you let him in? Yeah. No, yeah, he's he in. Paul, it. Paul, you're going to have to unmute yourself and ask the question. I see you have a hand up. Um, I'm sorry. I think that that was accidental. I was trying to minimize okay. the control bar and then I clicked on something. Sorry about that. All right. Thank you. That's okay. Yeah. So uh, when they're making the chart, both sides of this can be used. Uh, I usually go ahead and uh, laminate the chart for them because once they find a really nice chart and they've got it organized really nicely, then you don't have to worry about dirty hands and crumpling it up. So at least for the event, I have it, I've laminated, but you don't need to do that. Uh, and you could only bring your chart, your pencil to the event and the charts do not have to be turned in. It's not like some of those events where you turn it in. It's theirs to keep. But tell them, do not leave it when they leave the uh, station. So we've sort of talked about what can go on the chart. Uh, if that's information that will not be easily memorized. Uh, it does help if the kids make the charts themselves so they know where to find things and they know how they worded things or what these things mean. I do suggest you go over it with them to make sure that they've made it clear. Like when they put something on there, say, well, now do you know exactly what you meant by that? Uh, they should practice with the chart. Just have them sit down with the chart and say, find the density of talc for me and have them look it up. So they get used to looking things up. So they're very fast with these charts. And also I found that there's one team member that is usually more comfortable with looking up information than another one. It's not always true, but I found that usually happens. And if you practice with them, there will be, uh, it'll become clear to you if somebody is more comfortable with one or the other. Just like if you make, when you're making tests, it may become clear to you that someone's more comfortable with certain jobs than others. Building your team, this is basically building on what we've already said. Play to the team member's strengths. Who's better at filling out a zip grade? Who's better at looking up information? Uh, some kids just have a better eye for identification than the other, because a lot of this is an art, and some kids just have a better eye. Some kids have a better eye for igneous than they have for metamorphic. So look around, figure out who's better at what. And some kids are better at memorizing the material. So again, figure this out and then build to their strengths. Coaching tips. Identification is going to be the most important part of the test, but do not limit it to identification. Make sure they can answer questions. And we've talked about understanding the processes, why a specimen is the way it is. Here's a big one, the reason it's in bold. Make sure they understand the vocabulary. Just because they have on their chart that calcite is a rhombohedron doesn't mean they necessarily know what a rhombohedron is. I found a lot of errors last year when kids were asked a question about something that was in a rhombohedral shape and they didn't know what that shape was. To make sure they know what the vocabulary is. If possible, get physical samples. It helps to get their hands on the rocks. It really does. Make up tests, make up games, make flashcards, have them sort things. 
give them a whole pile of rocks and minerals and say, sort it into igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, minerals, and time them. Just so they get used to having that pressure of time. Uh, pick a realistic time, especially in the beginning. You might want to give them more and slowly shorten the time, but have them work against time. Uh, give them homework. Say, I want you to learn these, I want you to go through these three rocks and these three minerals, and when we come back, we're going to talk about them next time. Make your test. Test a lot, even if it's only one or two questions, even if it's just something as simple as putting three rocks out, uh, make two stations, and just ask them questions. And make, if you've got them, get them to fill out zip grades so they're used to it. Uh, try to do a simple test. Literally, if it takes you 10 minutes to make this test up for these kids, make up these tests. Uh, have them make a test for each other. You can assign that to them as a homework. Tell them, uh, this week before we meet, I want you to make three questions up. Uh, you can pick any rock, you can pick any one you want, but I need you to make three questions and have them give them to each other. That way you can, you can find out if they understand what it is that you want them to, to learn. Use the time limit so they get used to it. Put a few sets plus on the beach station just to give them some options. Uh, ask deeper questions for identification. And if you can, and maybe just once a month or something, make maybe a five or ten station test up and put it in a random pattern so they understand that they were going to have not random but in an odd pattern a snake or something not just a straight line so they learn to move from station to station and uh, also make sure well this is something we're going to talk about on the next slide uh, Make sure that the question number aligns to their zip grade number. N nobody except one team is going to start at question one. So make sure that there is somebody checking as they go through the test to make sure the number question that they are answering aligns to the question on that zip grade. Pick a kid whose job it is to do that. And stress that, that they are constantly checking that. Uh, make sure they don't argue. You could not believe the amount of time they have wasted. I've seen kids waste arguing about things. If you have to, pick somebody who is the final say. Answer every question. Wrong answers don't count against them. A guess is better than a blank. And tell them not to talk too loud. Other teams can hear them, and it gets very loud in that room, and they need to get, to get used to, if we, need, if we can get everybody to keep their volume down, everybody can hear a little better. Uh, don't leave anything behind. Don't leave the pencils. Don't leave the chart. Don't leave the zip grades. The other thing is, do not take any of the rocks or minerals with you when you move on. And uh, here's a list of resources. Uh, I don't know how many of you have found this, but if you go to the website, uh, if you look under the third bullet point, there is a place that uh, we've done some research on where you could find some rock and mineral kits. None of these kits are 100% covering what we've got on the list, but there are some that are better than others, and there's a comparison there for that. The workshop will be at the MISD on 28th of January from 10 a.m. to 12. I request that you do a registration just so we're aware of how many people will be showing up. And here's the information about Steve. And not all of, he's not going to have everything, but he said he has a lot. And uh, available PowerPoints right now, the slides from 2022 and 2020-17 are up on the website. I should have the slides that I'm going to be using for this year's workshop 
within the few, next few days. Please, I'm asking you all, if you plan on coming to the workshop, review these slides before the workshop and come prepared to ask questions because I will not have time to cover every slide in depth at the workshop. So if I don't cover a slide you have a problem with, uh, a question on, you can go ahead and ask me a question there and we will talk about it. But if nobody asks questions, um, I won't be able, if you haven't gone through the material ahead of time, you'll be able to have a question and you'll find after the workshop there was something that you had a question about. So I'm going to go ahead and share this. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Okay, Manisha, are you seeing any hands? Yeah, hi, uh, I do have a question. Sure. Um, the registration for the workshop, are you going to send us a link or how are we going to get that or is it on the go, website? If you go to the website mm -hmm. and look under workshops, there is a link there to register. Okay. Anybody else? Hi. Well, there's one I've more hand up. <coughs> right now. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're just fine. Okay. okay. Uh, well, I'm brand new to this, and um, I've had three children register for this event. Um, how many students am I allowed to have um, participating in the event? Okay, you can only have two. Uh, okay. But I would suggest that if you have three kids interested, uh, that you bring them, if you're going to come to the workshop, bring them all. Because one thing you're doing with that third kid who may not make your team this year is next year, they are already trained to compete in the event. So that okay, so we, oh yes, uh, so they're allowed to come to the workshop with me? Oh yeah, yeah, you can okay. bring three kids. I have no problem with three kids showing up. In fact, I think it's very useful uh, because if that kid is interested enough to want to be on your team, then it's to your benefit to keep that kid interested enough to come back next year. Okay, so would you suggest that I kind of train up all three and then maybe towards the end pick the strongest two? That's what I have done previously. Uh, uh, yeah, as long as they're all three interested, keep them involved until the very end and then you might let them, you know, let them know as you're going along that they are going, you're going to make a test and the test result will determine who goes. Uh, but yes, that's generally what I do. I keep them involved as long as I possibly can because soon enough uh, you lose them. You know, if, if you let them go too early, next year they're like, well, why should I bother? But if you yep. train them, then next year they're like, yeah, I like that. I did well. And this year I've already got a head start on learning the information. Especially. Sure. Thank yeah. Sure, if we are going to run out of the time, yeah, I wanted I'm to jump sure. in quick. So, yeah, and uh, else, uh, I have, ahead, I have shared my screen real quick. So here is on the lower right hand side is sign up now button for Rockhound. And for those of you who don't know the website, it's macomaso.org. Go to the elementary, go to the events, and then come to the Rockhound. And then you'll see this sign up now button. You hit that, that's where you sign up. Also, I wanted to say something real quick. If you have three kids, are you the head coach? You probably should be checking with the head coach as to how many kids you are allowed on a team. You're only allowed, I believe, 17 kids on the team. So if she is planning to use a kid that you are not planning to use, in your event and she is planning to use them in a different event or he is, then it's a problem. So I would say that issue should be sorted with the head coach. Yeah, right. You know, it's like, uh, I apologize. I always think of things selfishly, how it's going to benefit me. I, 
but I didn't think about that. Yeah, there, there may be one of those children may be in multiple events. So the other one, I would just bring them along for training if you can. Okay, I hope that answered everybody's questions. I hope to see you at the workshop. Again, remember if you're planning on purchasing rock samples and mineral samples, he only takes cash or check. So I'm gonna get out of here so Manish can move on to the next session. And uh, thanks everybody for coming.